Well, hello there. I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. This evening, I consider whether the growing independent brand bubble is about to burst, ponder the end of conventional watchmaking, and of course, I share your luxury watch wrist and themed shots. Remember, this is Watches Tonight, and the people who pay for these pixels, thewatchbox.com, open up a different window, keep me streaming, over 3,000 pre-owned and vintage watches available for buy, sell, and trading right now. And if you wish to do any of the above, we have a special email, team also at thewatchbox.com, where you can reach out to me and my team directly with your questions. Let's take a look at what you've got for me. Flipping the script, we have Tom G of the UK and his Swatch System 51, enjoying a bright day on vacation in Greece by the water. We have Macau B in Warsaw, preparing to take to the skies with his Omega DeVille Prestige Power Reserve. Alan W captures a glorious watch on a glorious day with his FP Journe Chronomet Bleu. And Kentaji of France shares his exquisite Molnar Fabri case back and fine entertainment online. That guy looks familiar. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches in this box. Let's jump and see which of you have joined. All right, we are loading up with Eddie Landsberg, a good friend, USA viewer, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Blue Shirt Buddha, Mr. No Date, Richard Combs from South Florida, Budic One joining in, Jenks72, Logan Hall from South Carolina, Cull Obsidian, Miko Stark, Catching us live for once, watches and whiskey joining in. We got Colin H. We got Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina. Both of the Carolinas represented. We can now move on. That said, I want to remind you guys, we are living in a golden age of independent brands. Truly, never save perhaps the peak of 18th century and 19th century bespoke pocket watch manufacturer have there been so many small volume, ultra high end, independent watchmakers ready to provide your dream watch. Now this is the problem. Remember the late 1990s dot com explosion followed by the roughly 2001 to 2002 implosion. That guy in particular, the sock puppet mascot of Pets.com, was an infamous symbol of this era. And I think anyone in the US who remembers these commercials know exactly what I'm expressing with this puppet. Now here's the other thing. There was also the late 2010s explosion of hand-built bicycles. Uh, it started in the 2010s and it continues to sweep Europe, but the trend of a million different people welding the same triangles in steel or titanium has gradually caught up as the saturation has taken place and some of them have failed. All of which is to say, whenever you're selling something that is broadly hyped and subject to limited demand, there is going to be a carrying capacity. And I think right now, independents are just about at their limit. Throw in global struggles due to coronavirus and economic slowdowns that have resulted. And I really do think like we're gonna see a culling of the herd. Uh, example, I was gonna list independent brands for this segment. I was actually gonna write out the names of all the independents I can think of and just do a roll call. But when I got past 50 names, some of which are as large as Moser making 1500, Richard Mille making 5000, and some of which are as small as Philippe Dufour making probably single digits worth of watches each year. The problem is there's a lot of them. And a lot of them are indistinguishable from one another. And for every Voudelainen and Dufour and Moser and Jorn, there are a bunch of brands people have barely heard of who have no idea how to market themselves. Like I said, a culling is in the offing, and I don't like to say that. For starters, let's clear the air regarding the definition of an independent, because I can already hear some of you saying, AP and Patek have never been stronger, Grand Seiko is a brand on the rise, and that's true, but that's why representatives of the real independents don't like to use that term. Patek and Audemars Piguet are both billion dollar companies. Rolex and Seiko, technically they're standalone independents, but I think you understand that something feels very different. They're not like the Jorns and the Mosers of the world. So the independent brands generally call each other indies, which is a way of describing a smaller non-group affiliated, often boutique style watchmaker. And here's the problem. If you go back to the Carré des Horlogers back in 2019 at SIHH, I guess the last of the normal times, I was looking around that 
square of independent brands talking to a member of the independent brand community and we were just speculating on how many of those brands wouldn't last 18 months. Now I don't say this because I have any umbrage towards them but because frankly there are just too many. So what I want to try to pinpoint is the risk factors for brands that are not a good bet as a consumer and then focus on some of the brands that are a better bet because frankly they're easy to spot and it's a good thing to buy a watch from a company that will be around to take care of its product especially with watches because they do last so long now jumping into our box real quick we have watch habit saying Kudoka is a great brand that is starting to gain the credit it deserves it is true since the Kudoka 2 the company has become a lot more appealing to the mainstream. Previously, the watches were too large, too bizarrely ornate. Uh, they were an acquired taste. Now, the price and the quality, as well as the size and the style, are right in line with what the market is really demanding. That's not to say the original Kodoka watches aren't beautiful, just that they were very idiosyncratic. Think Crador Fugaku Torbion, and you have a pretty good idea of what I mean, only in more of a European paradigm. Now, right here, Edward Ledden asks, where do you buy your bikes? I haven't bought a bike since 2011. It's a Holland Exagrid. It is custom made for me. It's mostly titanium. It has some carbon fiber inserts to deaden vibrations. But I'm thinking of maybe building a new custom bike and going with Bill Holland of San Diego again. He's got new carbon frame for the first time. If there's new Shimano Dura Ace next year, I'll probably build up a bike with the new Dura Ace, but I don't want to build something to the old standards. I've already got a bike for those. J Jaybo Surf from Adelaide, Australia is in the box right here. We've got El Gusto. We've got K. Kyle. We've got Ben Space Vulture. And then we have a question from BS about Moser and Moser's actually doing pretty well, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. We've got Often Licked saying, a Dufour or Roger Smith are absolute dream watches, but Hajime Aseoka, Lang und Heine, Moritz Grossmann, and others are amazing. And it's true, we could just keep listing them, and that's part of the problem. So what are the at-risk brands? Well, broadly, you want to apply some rules of thumb. At-risk are brands with management tumult. Have you heard phrases like four CEOs? That's bad. Have you heard about founders coming and going, about money problems, about primary investors taking direct control? Those are the kind of stories that are like red flags. Even though you can't quite see what's going on internally, you can see people coming and going through the door. So look for that. Look for headlines about that. Find a brand that has stable long-term management. Also, consider that companies that are too reliant on a single market can find themselves in dire straits very quickly. A lot of independents were extremely dependent on Hong Kong, and the independent scene took a huge blow as a result of the need to sell through Hong Kong, both for the Hong Kong domestic market as well as for the distribution through the region that happens in Hong Kong. Remember, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the world's Swiss watch exports wind their way through Hong Kong each year in a normal year. Also important, brand new companies just established. You look at a company like Erwerk that's been around since 1997. You look at a company like F.P. Journe that's been around since 1999. debatoon has been around since 2002. But when you have companies that measure their existence in months or at most one, two years, you really have to ask who's behind the company, not just the watchmakers and the artisans that we all love. They're often the standard bearers and the people who are pushed out front to represent and bring in attention. Ask who are the business minds behind this company? Where have they worked before? What's on their resume? Check them on LinkedIn. You can probably find them. But figure out who's financing and who's making the management decisions. Because the world is full of stories about really cool brands by awesome watchmakers that failed because ultimately the business side didn't add up. A great example of that would be MCT. Really cool stuff. Denny Giguet, he was behind the Harry Winston Opus 11, possibly the most ridiculously complex watch display I've ever seen. But MCT is no longer around, and if you bought one of their fabulously complicated time displays, you're probably wondering right now, who's going to care for this watch in the future? And that's a legitimate question. Now, let's talk a little bit about brands for sale. When you see a brand up for sale, that's usually a sign of distress. 
companies that are on solid financial footing rarely wind up hitting the market. Like when Breitling was sold. Breitling was not at its peak in 2017, but it was robustly profitable. The first we heard of a Breitling sale was the day the sale happened. When companies are announced for sale and no buyer is already in place, that's a bad sign. I was approached by a major industry figure, someone with real money, about a week ago regarding interest in buying a boutique brand that was on the market. And that was a sign of duress, because you're talking about a company that makes beautiful things. They almost all make beautiful things. This company made 50 pieces a year. And I had to say, frankly, the fact that we're being approached means they don't already have a buyer in hand, which means they have hat in hand. Look for that, recalibrate. Now, let's talk about better bets, and I wanna name names here. I don't wanna beat up on anyone. Obviously, I could call an entire roster of failed brands and failing brands, but that's why I'm giving you the tools to do your Google searches. Now I'm gonna talk about some brands that are on a better footing that you can buy with confidence, new or pre-owned. And I'm gonna talk first about Grubel Forsey. A couple of reasons. First, the people behind the company, Robert Grubel and Stephen Forsey, had other sources of income. They founded a company called Completime SA, which does a a lot of white label engineering and movement development for other brands. So a little bit like Porsche had the engine of VW patents funding it through the 50s and 60s and 70s. You wonder how they managed to compete with the best in the world? Well, mostly because of all those licensing payments coming in from Volkswagen. Grubel 4C was founded with money from Completime, and that meant they had a cash stream to start up, and it continues. Moreover, back in 2006, shortly after they went public with their first product, Grubel Forsey got a 20% investment stake from Richemont. So 20% of the company went to one of the biggest luxury groups in the world. That means they have a stakeholder, someone with skin in the game. How important is this? Well, remember, when the original Hoyer company was, was failing, uh, Rolex BN, which is the it's the Western non-foundation branch of Rolex. It's basically where the movements are made, but Rolex BN was a major stakeholder in Hoyer, and Jack Hoyer didn't actually realize this until after he'd already lost control of his company, but he could have called in favors from a major stakeholder in Rolex, because at the time, Rolex was betting on Hoyer's electronic movement development. And again, if you have that kind of a sugar daddy, it's a good thing. Hoyer might have been saved as a family firm if they'd just known about it at the time. Grubel Forsey is on a good footing because they've got Completime and they've got Richemont money and ultimately the security that comes with it. Now, F.P. Journe. Mr. Journe founded his company in the late 90s and while his name is on the dial, the name of the company has always been Montrejourne. So there is no F.P. Journe watch, there are Montrejourne watches and that's important because he has always had stakeholders and investors. He has never been the sole owner or controller of his company. And while he's sold stakes, he's never sold a stake so large that he loses control. But in 2018, he brought in his first large institutional luxury group, and that was Chanel. Chanel, of course, is far larger than any independent watch brand. And they provide a level of technology, parts access, engineering, and yes, money that gives F.P. Journe a leg up. First, Journe is having no trouble selling 900 watches a year. But at the end of the day, in really tough times, it's great to be connected to a company that measures its revenues in billions, not millions of dollars. And that's what F.P. Journe has with Chanel. I would also mention Richard Mille. Now, Richard Mille was founded in 1999 by the eponymous businessman from France. Richard Mille is not and never was a watchmaker or an engineer. He's a businessman, he's a marketer. But early on, Audemars Piguet took a large stake in the company. That's one of the reasons why watches like the RM53 Pablo McDonald II are built by Audemars Piguet. So not only does Audemars Piguet benefit from owning a piece of the successful Richard Mille and the revenues that result, but they also derive business directly from the orders at Renault et Papit, where the high-end Richard Mille watches are made for RM by AP. And again, if times ever get super desperate, we're not there yet, but it's nice to have Audemars Piguet, a company with 1.2 billion Swiss francs in annual revenue, backing your 5,000 unit a year independent. 
Romain Gautier. Now, this is a much smaller company than the others. We're talking dozens, perhaps, of any given model line per year. They're not cranking up production, and frankly, they don't have to. Romain Gautier already does engineering work for other watch brands inside the Chanel family of companies. If you've seen the Monsieur de Chanel, that's one example, but I've been told that their actual reach is deeper and more extensive. So they have in-house work that can provide them with some revenues, or at least credits, inside the company. Second, Romain Gautier is not a watchmaker. As with Richard Neal, he is two things unrelated to watchmaking, or at least the manual sense of watchmaking. Romain Gautier is a production engineer, and he's a businessman. He's an MBA, and early on, he decided that he needed a deeper and more thoroughly rooted professional business background if he was going to run the company. Again, F.P. Journe is the head of watchmaking at F.P. Journe. He has always had a president. He has always had a CEO to take care of business. Romain Gautier understood that since he wasn't going to be making the watches, and he wouldn't be doing all the design himself either, he needed to run the company, and he needed experience and credentials to do that. Second, as with F.P. Journe, he sold a double-digit stake, a little bit more than 20%, to Chanel, which means they are both a stakeholder in his success and a beneficiary from the work that his engineers do for other companies in their group. Now, here's an odd one. Armin Strong. And you might ask, why is this tiny artisanal maybe 400 piece a year manufacturer out of BN being mentioned alongside companies that are partly run by heavyweights with billions of dollars worth of revenue? Well, the funny thing about Armin Strong is that their CEO, Serge Michel, is part of the Michel family, which is a pharmaceutical dynasty. And his father, Willie, is worth almost $2 billion. This is a family project that's backed by pharmaceutical dollars. That's a recipe, if not for automatic success, certainly for survival. Armin Strom himself retired and left the company years ago. He is dead. Armin Strom today is a passion project of the Michel family, which means they're able to develop in-house calibers that ordinarily a company of this size would have no business marketing. It's why they have one of the best heads of technical development in the business. And it's why, frankly, even in bad times, you can expect these guys to pull through. And they have a very cool customizer on their website where you can basically make the wackiest version imaginable of every one of their watches. So while I'm touting these brands, I'm also touting the customizer and the website interface of Armin Strom. Like I said, money well spent, and they've got a lot of it. Now, De Bethune. This is a company that most of us call De Bethune, and I know I did before I was corrected, but realistically, they have not always been on a firm financial footing. They were founded by two people who were more about the passion side of watchmaking and watch selling. David Zanetta, a collector and well-known vintage vendor, served as their first head of business and also their designer, and of course Denis Flageolet, who's as good as anyone in the world and better than most, he handled the engineering and the design of the movements. But here's the deal. In 2017, they brought in actual businessmen. A man named Giovanni Perrin, as well as a large U.S. dealer, put money in. Now, Perrin represents the Luxembourg-based private equity group Three Stones Capital. So Three Stones is not the biggest equity group. They don't manage quite one billion in assets. But again, when you're talking hundreds of millions of euros worth of capital under management, you're talking something far larger than your average watch brand that makes 150 pieces a year. So this is why De Bethune is on a better footing. Between one of their largest regional distributors going in with an equity stake and the money from Three Stones, they have a lot of money to develop new models and finally, hopefully, market the brand properly. It also helps with after-sales service. And I should also mention they brought in Previously, their most successful actual CEO in Pierre Jacques. He ran the company from 2011 to 2015, and he increased production to what was at the time, and which remains to this day, their highest yearly volume of about 400 pieces. He left after 2015. The company went into the red. He returned in 2017. So for once, the company finally has a sound business team and money to market itself, develop watches, and overcome its past mistakes. All of this is very important if you are the buyer. You want your brand to survive to service the pieces. Now, another one, H. Moser and C. This is another company that went into the red and was threatened with dissolution, although they were founded in about 2006 uh, by 
a dental implant magnet, Thomas Strawman. It was a reestablished company using a well-known 19th and early to mid 20th century name. But Strawman reportedly spent something approaching 100 million Swiss francs on Moser, only to find the company for sale at fire sale prices. And that's where the story changes in 2012. MELB Holdings, led by the Melan family that previously led Audemars Piguet in the 90s, but MELB brought in scale, business management credentials, people who had run successful companies in the past, and above all, capital to rationalize production, improve after-sales service, fix the watches so they went out the door right the first time, reduce the number of SKUs, and provide a better product. So Moser today makes about 1,500 watches a year, and I like to call them the German-Swiss FP Journe, not necessarily because there's a watchmaker in chief at the head of the company. No, their, their dominant personality and marketing hero is going to be CEO Edouard Melan, but the fact that they do keep production relatively low, that they do so much in-house, that they own the ability to make parts right down to the hairsprings, the balances, and the escapements, and that they are very distinctive in their style. You could argue that oddballs like the streamliner aside, there is a Moser house look, just as there's an F.P. Journe house look. You see one of the watches, you immediately identify it, even when in the case of the purity and the concept dials, there's literally nothing printed on the dial. No branding, no name, it doesn't even say Swiss made because it goes without saying you know it is. So these are the independents that really deserve the most consideration. First, because of the quality of the product they make. Second, because of the stability of their business side. Third, because they have the capacity to service the watches they make. And fourth, because they're likely to survive to service those watches far down the line. All of this is absolutely critical to you laying out 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 or more on an independent. And heck, if you're spending $1,000 of your own money, you deserve some sense of security that your investment, whether we want to use that word or not, the money spent is relatively safe. Okay, now let's take a look at what you guys are saying. Ba -ba 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 what are your favorite independents also? Let me know. And then we have NS something saying the DeBethune DB28 Digital is truly awesome. That's true. It is my current Grail watch. I thought it was the Longa Zeitwerk, and then I fell in love with a different jump hour. That Digital is the watch that I would break the bank to buy, and I might break the bank to buy. I can see right here, ba -ba -ba bump. We have a comment from Jumbo Jet Pilot saying Arm and Straw makes amazing watches they always have. That's true. They went from building very artisanal, highly engraved and skeletonized ETA based watches to about 2009 starting to make their own movements. Today, they make everything from a minute repeater to a resonance watch to a minute repeater with resonance. They're an innovative company. Are all their ideas original? No, they didn't come up with that resonance watch idea. That's not theirs. But they make a nice product. They're a friendly, approachable company. And again, the fact that they allow customization is really cool, and it appeals to me as a collector. I can also say that John Tsai loves the Logical One from Romain Gautier, and I have to say, I agree with you. Those are some of the coolest watches made. And if you want to talk about finishing, some brands, we're, we're not talking about Carrie Vu Lin, and we're not talking about Philippe Dufour, Roger Smith. We're not talking about brands that are really small, but let's talk about brands that are in the upper echelon and make watches in series. Grubel Forcy, Romain Gautier, Chronometry Fernand Berthoud. These are companies that are at the absolute peak of fine finish. If it's not a one-man brand like Dufour, you gotta talk about those three as perhaps being the best series production in terms of pure beauty and ambition of finishing. You see outward angles, you see inward angles, you see expanses of black polish so broad you could almost brush your teeth and trim your beard using them as a mirror. So those are all names to know. And then here's a question from Colin H. How do you get an accessible independent without breaking the bank? I guess there is a certain amount of risk there. Well, I mean, if we're talking about the indies, the companies that are making a few dozen or a few hundred pieces a year, it's true, it can be difficult to say. But I would say RGM has many watches under $10,000. Stefan Kudoka has watches under $10,000. I would also say Pita Barcelona has many watches under $10,000 and with 
Peter Barcelona, you know, you're talking AHCI luminary alongside the likes of Voodalainen and Dufour and Mr. Jorn. So again, that's Peter Barcelona. They're a small company. Uh, they are friendly, approachable, a father-son team, very likable and very innovative. You're gonna find plenty of sub $10,000 indies. They are out there. And if you want something that's independent but not quite an indie in the high luxury sense, consider Ming. Great watches designed in Malaysia and of course built in Switzerland. I would also go so far as to say if you want to look at a larger independent that's making tens of thousands, not hundreds, consider something like Zinn. After all, they are independent of any group and you're not going to spend more than five grand on a really nice watch. All of that's important, but your watches are important too. Viewer wrist shots number two. Let's talk about Marcio of Maastricht and his Breguet 3350. A tourbillon to take on a walk with Lola the dog. Let's talk about Kurt A, preparing for his final commercial flight as a pilot in Hong Kong with his beautiful Pepsi bezel. We have JCS, showcases his Omega Speedmaster Michael Schumacher, cure for the common moonwatch. And Conrad goes hardcore with his Suzuki GSXR, his Gixxer 600 Supersport and Rolex Submariner two-tone. All right, guys, are we approaching the end of conventional watchmaking? This is an interesting question because it parallels what's happening in the classic car community right now. I'm going to read one of your comments real quick, though, because I love what you guys say. NS something saying, great three-piece independent collection, Moser Pioneer Perpetual Calendar, DB28 Digital, MBNF Legacy Machine, and I'm going to go with Jumbo Jet's suggestion that RGM is another great underrated brand. All good stuff. James Con 11 is asking, what about crayon? Beautiful watches, unattainable prices. But you are getting an interesting machine. But beware, very new brand. Okay, let's talk about the end of conventional watchmaking. I'm very sincere about this. This isn't just some alarmist, hysterical thing to grab click, uh, clicks. So it's not the clickbait, it's the substance that I want you to think about here. I had an interesting exchange recently with a veteran Mercedes-Benz mechanic from the Mercedes-Benz Classic Center in California. Now, this is a branch of the global Mercedes Classic Center. The original, of course, is in Germany. And their job, in theory, is to perform restorations of their older cars, to provide service and parts for their older cars, and even to sell some of the restored cars as Mercedes-Benz vehicles out of the Classic Center showroom. And in theory, they provide parts and service and technical knowledge for Mercedes-Benz products dating back to the reign of Kaiser Wilhelm. The first Kaiser Wilhelm, yep. Ended in 1888 in the first Benz patent motor wagon, 1887, so there's one year of overlap. But here's the problem. The conversation I had with this older Benz mechanic at the Classic Center revolved around parts support and historical recognition for the Mercedes-Benz W140 S-Class, a machine of huge interest to people of my generation who remember this as one of the apex cars of our childhood. If you came of age in the 90s, you remember this car. You remember the way to the door if you ever got to sit inside one. You remember the window glass that was as thick as a thumb. You remember the V12 engine that seemed bonkers outside of supercars at the time. And of course, you remember that these cars costed almost as much as something like a contemporary Bentley or Rolls Royce once you started getting into a dozen cylinders and beyond. All of which is to say these cars were very complex. And here's the problem. The Mercedes mechanic told me that the W140 status as a future collectible is debated at Mercedes Classic right now. They're actually trying to figure out whether to offer parts and service into the future for this car because its classic status and its survivability in the long term might be undermined by its sheer complexity. We're talking wiring harnesses, pumps, accumulators, reservoirs, printed circuit boards, all these computers, so many of them, seven just for the engine. And these things are all using proprietary obsolete programming languages from the 90s, some of which were developed in the 80s. Which is to say that many mechanics won't go anywhere near them, and Mercedes itself wonders if these cars will even survive as they fizzle out and break down. So here is the climate control wiring diagram for a W140. If that looks impenetrable, guess what? Most Mercedes mechanics are going to agree with you. And in comparison, the mechanic told me that the previous generation of S-Class, the Benz W126, a car that was the ultimate Benz of the 1980s, he tells me that these are serviceable by normal mechanics. 
They love to work on them at the Classic Center. Mercedes-Benz Classic still provides parts for them. Not just engine and chassis stuff, but body panels, interior trim, veneers, the stuff that's usually really tough to get on a restoration or any vintage car. So the mechanic's point was clear. There's a threshold of complication at which conventional auto mechanics with hand tools, shop manuals, and vocational training won't be able to sustain a car. So what does that mean? Because the W140 remains a dream car for guys my age, but if even Mercedes can't keep it up, if you look at the parallel of increasing complication and proprietary parts, synthetic materials and industrial technique in the watchmaking space, you're realizing where I'm going with this. So. Other 1990s cars like the Lincoln Mark 8, the Lexus LS400, the BMW E38 7 Series, and the E31 8 Series, they define the first generation of cars that might not be preservable by the classic car movement, largely due to the sheer amount of irreparable sealed electronics, proprietary programming language, and compound electro-pneumatic or electro-hydraulic systems. We stand on that same threshold in the watch industry today. Let's take a look at some of your wrist shots. First, Mr. Enigma and his Seiko SAGQ007. They're out on the beach, weather be damned. It doesn't look like a sunny day, but once you're already wet, it doesn't really matter. Nectarius awaits a new addition to the family with his wife, an heirloom-to-be Rolex Hulk, a lovely shot, and congratulations. Lawrence L. is ready for action with tools of the trade and Torby military enamel. Matthew P. shares a his and hers shot with a Rolex Oyster date, 6694, and a Universal Genève Polaroider date. A gorgeous shot, well framed. Good quality, too. Guys, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Send me your wrist shots if you want to see your pieces on these pixels. Now, let's talk about watches moving beyond watchmaking. Where are we at this moment? Let's talk about silicon parts. This is the full assortment of a Patek Philippe Advanced Research Series 5550P. That was the one that was the perpetual calendar. All of those parts are fabricated by industrial process and once broken are irreparable. They can't even be finished manually. Now, industrial process. Perhaps you've heard of LIGA. Nickel phosphorus for the watch industry is generally made by LIGA, which is a microlithography. Here's an example of parts created using LIGA, which is a German acronym, in case you're wondering. That can't be created by artisanal process. A watchmaker can't make things like that, can't repair things like that. In some cases, can barely even see things like that. And yet, that array of parts you saw before comes from Mimotech, which is a major Swiss LIGA fabricator that supplies nickel phosphorus components. These are finding their way into watches, watches that no watchmaker will be able to repair without simply placing an identical replacement part into the position. Let's talk about ceramic cases and sapphire cases. Here we have a case that resists scratches, resists scuffs. It doesn't mark, and when you buy one used, you know it hasn't been refinished because it can't be refinished. The problem, it's binary. It's either broke or it's not broke. It won't scratch, but it will fracture and it can shatter. The same is true for sapphire cases. When was the first sapphire case marketed? It was 1997 on the Alas Silberstein Chrono Saphir. 10 pieces were made with sapphire cases, and at the time, it was beyond exotic. Alas Silberstein is gone. If you need to replace that case today, you are out of luck. Now, you're gonna have to hope that if you break your Panerai Ceramica 30 years down the line, Panerai has OEM new old stock replacements ready to go. Otherwise, I don't even know what happens to that movement and dial. Let's talk about sealed for life watches. They're coming. That's the PAM ID Lab, the PAM 700. It has a 50 year service interval. Now Panerai is selling a watch with a 70 year warranty. Sealed for life watches with advantage in coatings, synthetics, artificial diamond, ceramic, graphite, plastics, fiberglass. All of these components can be used to create a watch that is devoid of service requirements, that can run on self-lubricating pivots forever. We're getting there. Remember the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage Chronograph Chrono Works? It reduced a large number of the jewels in the movement. It completely eliminated them. It also eliminated lubrication for some of the wheels by placing silicon pivots directly into ceramic bridges. 
the unserviceable watch that's sealed for life and needs no service is coming. And it stands to reason that watchmakers will have very little to do with these watches once they're assembled and cased up. Let's talk about insane complication. We mentioned MCT before, the company founded by Denny Giguet. Well, he created the Harry Winston Opus 11 before that. There it is right there. What time is it? Who the hell knows? I kid, I kid. You can see five at the center and then the scrolling minutes. But the problem here, what if he's not around in 30 years and the watch is? What if Swatch Group loses interest in Harry Winston, which has always been its redheaded stepchild brand? Who can take this apart, clean it, service it, and put it back together without factory tech documents, movement holders, proprietary training, and tools? I don't think anyone. And it's not just watches like this. Consider that during the 90s, when the ETA 2894 came out, it's a modular chronograph based on a 2892 base. This is a notoriously difficult movement to service unless you have the right movement holder for the 2894. And that's a very simple ETA-based caliber. Now, think about it. We have all these Richemont companies. We have all these Swatch Group companies. We have a lot of independents doing things that are shoot the moon ambitious. And unless you're an actual watchmaker at those companies in those brands, you're gonna have no idea and no ability to service these watches. Consider that even Rolex complications, such as the Yachtmaster II with its caliber 4161, or the Skydweller with its caliber 9001, these are watches that have to go back to Rolex for service, so even independent Rolex service shops are not allowed to service these, and they never have been. They can service a 3135 and a Submariner, but once you start talking these new age Rolex complications, which are only going to become more numerous, all of a sudden, only Rolex itself can do the service, and this is multiplying throughout the industry. Every brand is doing things like this, which means your old shade tree mechanic alternative, the old school guy who learned on ETA, Piguet movements, JLC 889s, and Rolex, that guy, your local watchmaker, is going to be increasingly closed out from the world in which those high-end watches are actually serviced. He's not gonna have the training, he's not gonna have the tools, he's not gonna have the certification or the parts. Let's talk about factory monopolies. Since we're talking about watches that have to go back for service, even when there's not a requirement, as there is with Rolex, can you really imagine any independent watchmaker locally in Ohio, even in Harrison, Ohio, at the AWCI, can you imagine them servicing a Zeitwerk? Do you see them taking apart that caliber L043 and doing that locally? What do you do if you need a bridge? What do you do if you need a movement holder that you don't have, or you have to make a tool and then try your bodge job on the Zeitwerk movement? Most people aren't even gonna touch it. It's gonna be like, it, it, it's gonna be like a birth defect that's wrapped around an artery. Doctors won't touch it. It's the kind of thing that is theoretically possible. There are no silicons in this watch. There is no ceramic. There's, there's no Liga. There, there's no industrially fabricated parts, and yet the sheer degree of complexity and specialization raises real questions about whether anyone outside of Glasuta is gonna be able to service that watch. And that also spells the end for your local watchmaker, for the fraternity of watchmakers, the trade of watchmakers outside the bounds of factory walls. Let's consider failed independence and their proprietary parts. Now, of course, Alain Silberstein was one of the first during the 1980s, and we'll start with Alain Silberstein because, well, by the way, that's Romain Jerome, and Romain Jerome is out of business, so if you needed case parts for your Romain Jerome, you're gonna have to find them new old stock, or otherwise you're probably out of luck. Now, you might get away. You might just need movement services, and the movements are common, ETA, Salida, Concepto, although I have to say some of the Haute de gamme pieces with tourbillons are going to be a little bit more challenging down the line, but just consider Alain Silberstein. Now, this is the era when the movement inside was fairly conventional, but perhaps the hands, the cases, the crowns, the straps, all these things are proprietary, and if they need to be serviced, you're going to have to find a surviving example because Alain Silberstein is out of business. Let's talk about MCT. We talked about it before. We talked about the Harry Winston Opus 11. This Sequential movement is incredibly complicated. It involves rotating shutters. It involves jump hour mechanisms. It involves scrolling minutes. A lot of things that, in aggregate, lead up to a watch that no normal watchmaker would want to touch. So who handles stuff like this? I don't even know. But all I can tell you is that your local Rolex guy is not going to be able to fix it. 
So let's take a look at what you guys are saying right now. We have Enigma saying Rolex UK doesn't want to service a Tudor day date as they say they don't have parts for it, even though the same movement is in the Glamour day date. Well, here's the thing. Rolex service can be idiosyncratic. Sometimes they take vintage watches, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they take older Tudor watches, sometimes they don't. And then right here, Brick Lane is saying, try servicing a Zeitwerk. No thank you. <laughs> I'd be happy to just be able to work my way through the standard ETA calibers. Uh, we have other questions right here. Mm, let's see. Bob Golub is saying, that is the Swatch concept. Buy and throw away, no service possible. That is the Swatch watch concept. I'm not going to lay that on Swatch as a group. You can still service a Breguet, you can still service a Mito, but definitely when a luxury watch starts to feel like a Swatch watch and you don't have service and parts options, you can feel like a goldfish in a draining bowl running out of water. And I can also see right here, BNS is saying, let's stick to simple time only watches. While well, Steve Berg notes, hello Tim and everyone. Jorn has its own proprietary screws so no one else can open its watches. That is also true. Jorn, like we said though, is on firmer footing. Now let's talk real quick about what's going to happen as a result of all this. Some collectors will embrace complexity, commit to only servicing their watches with the factory, and then hope their factories will survive. Others will turn to the eternally serviceable world of vintage watches. They'll say, look, as far as I'm concerned, the world of watches ends in roughly 1983. I'm sticking with vintage Rolex, vintage Blancpain, Omega, Universal Genève. I'm sticking with watches that use movements that have been around for decades, that can be repaired, for which parts can be fabricated locally. Those people are going to be the vintage mavens, and they're going to drive the eternally restorable world of vintage watches. They're the equivalent of the people with the Enzo-era Ferraris, the 1957 Chevys, the 1965 Fuley Stingray Corvette, the people with the Mercedes Gullwings. These are the people who own the watches and the cars that use such conventional parts, tools, and service methods that they will always be around even after their far newer replacements have essentially become obsolete and unserviceable. Still others might decide to pick the dwindling selection of modern watches that use universally serviceable common movements. I look at the Richemont group and all these proprietary in-house calibers and Val Fleurier movements made just for Richemont brands. Which Richemont watches are most likely to be independently serviceable in the year 2050? Probably Baum and Mercier, because they're still using basically Salida and ETA calibers that anyone can work on. I predict the outcome of this is that watchmaking as a profession will become more of a vintage service and restoration trade focused on older models and movements. Much like Mercedes mechanics feel totally competent servicing the W116s and W126s. These are cars that will live forever because they're almost purely mechanical. That is a lot like what the watchmaking profession will look like. We'll see those old Rolex, those old Omegas, those Baum and Mercier pieces, those old JLC 889s and Peguet movements from the 80s. They will continue to be renewed again and again and again as the MCTs of the world essentially become extinct. So here's the thing, I haven't given up on the W140 as a potential future Mercedes classic. It might still be savable. Maybe parts will return. Maybe tech support will return. But who knows? I'm an optimist, not a realist sometimes. And I do worry about the future repairability of the partially silicon and monstrously complex Vacheron Twin Beat when an haute de gamme Haute horlogerie watch includes silicon and so much proprietary tech, I do wonder whether even Vacheron will be taking care of it a hundred years hence. But that's going to be a problem for a different generation and a different era of watchmakers. Let's see what you got for me. Viewer wrist shots, number four. All right. Steve K demonstrates his dexterity and sharp collection, including six from Watchbox. Thank you for trusting our company. Jeff R clearly is spoiling his dog. If that's what Fido's got, I'd love to see your watch collection, Jeff. Brian L. of North Carolina sports his North Carolina Watch Club edition, Nomos, and his 2015 Mini Cooper S. That's right, if you have a local watch club, you can get a bespoke Nomos. Jared L. from Long Island, my island of origin. He shares my love for cars and watches with his PAM 292 and his new dream car recently collected, the Tesla Model S Performance. Wear it and drive it in great health. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. And remember to join me on Facebook, 
Talking Time with Tim Masso. Comment below and subscribe. Remember, tmasso at thewatchbox.com for all of your watch collecting needs. Thank you so much. Thanks to my crew, Sean, in the studio today. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.